Hello and welcome to Down the Slope. Um, in case you don't recognise my voice, I'm Ewan. I've not been here for a couple of weeks. Uh, but we've got a full house. Um, Harry, you're back in London after coming up for the derby. How are you doing, mate? Well, I was fine until you reminded me that I'm back in London after coming up for the derby, mate. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not too bad. How are you doing? Been missing you on the pod. Uh, no, no, I'm good, mate. I'm good. I enjoyed listening to you whilst I was away. I thought the, the derby one was good. Uh, Michael's always a welcome addition when he's on. Greg, how you doing, my man? Very well, how are you? Just answered that. Uh, Liam? I'm doing well, mate. Doing really well. Good. Ask him. <laughs> Ask him. <laughs> right. We're going to review the derby, everything that came along with that, review the January transfer window, look ahead to St Mirren game, plenty to get through tonight. Let's start with the derby on Tuesday night. Greg? What did you let's start with the starting eleven? Came out at what quarter past six? Uh, mm-hmm. It would have been. What did what did you make of the starting eleven? Obviously, Kevin Dabrowski making his first start. Yeah, Maloney had me at Dabrowski. To be fair, <laughs> that was uh, it was good to see because to be honest, that Joker doesn't deserve any games, especially after his performance at the weekend. I think I think he's, he was out injured though. Is that correct? Yeah, hey, that's that's actually, the line. Aye, yeah, he wasn't actually dropped. Um, it's funny because he drops everything. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I was quite pleased with the lineup. Um I was feeling quite positive actually. Yeah, Phil... the game, I thought I thought that the lineup was was competitive. Uh, the players that dropped out had to be dropped. Um so yeah, I, I was feeling fairly fairly good. Aye, uh, Liam, Harry, we, we the three of us were together before the game. Harry, you felt it was a pretty attack on Oliver in terms of but at least the personnel on the park. Did it translate the way that you envisaged it would? Um, I think so. I, I didn't really expect too much from the game in the first place. I always predicted it was a high score threat in Bernard because it's always my dream beforehand. But um, yeah, I think both teams kind of struggled to break each other down. So I don't think Maloney could have picked a better team than he picked, to be fair. Yeah. Um, Liam, obviously, um, let's give you a little moment. I know we mentioned Dabrowski to Greg, but you've been calling for it for, I don't know, pre season? <laughs> just how surprised were you when you seen that he was in the starting 11 and be, were you impressed? I, 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 I've been calling for it since Macy let that free kick in against Celtic where he was standing in the wrong position. <laughs> now, nah, I mean, I think it's, it's at times maybe it's gone a wee bit. I may say over the top, but at times my agenda has been maybe a wee bit too clear, and I've not I've not been Matt Macy's biggest fan since since day since day one virtually. Um, and I was oh, I'm, I'm not going to lie, I was happy and somewhat relieved to see the Brovsky named in the team sheet for a number of different reasons. But I think first and foremost, just that a guy who's been at the club for five plus years just touched upon 76 times he's been named on the bench and never picked I think it was just really nice to actually have a have him playing yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Greg obviously the back three um, we've seen some changes again um, Porteous Rocky and Lewis Stevenson so oh, they did play the majority of the game at Levy but obviously McGinn, McGinn started that game do you think that's currently our first choice three obviously with injuries to Hanlon and Clark Say so at the moment that there's not really anything else. Um, I don't think Paul McGinn does enough ever to get ahead of the three. Um, I, I mean, coming on to the game, I thought Lewis Stevenson was poor at the start, um, picked up a silly booking for being the wrong side. Uh, Rocky seems to be a bit too nonchalant, but Ryan Porteous is just absolute caviar at the back. Absolute caviar. See, see when he's on that sort of form, five million pound easy. But and, when he's, and when he's on the living, yes. and when he's on the living form, he's worth about five on the packet of crisps. Yes, but yes, yeah, to answer your question, yes, that 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 is probably the back three I would prefer. Um, maybe a couple of question marks still on it over Rocky, but yeah, um, I'm I'm sure we'll get onto that in more depth. D- Liam, did we see on uh, Tuesday night potentially that Portress is much more suited to playing in the middle of the three as opposed to the right where he was for the majority of the game, at least against Livingston. Mm, no, nah, I don't agree. I don't. I don't. I don't think that's a fair hypothesis to draw after that. After one game, um, I think there's there's pros and cons to Porteous playing in the middle. There's 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 huge pros and of him playing on the right in terms of how he can get on the ball and distribute things. He had a good game. He had a very good game. But we'd be talking about it very differently if uh, a penalty was given for the Lewis Stevenson shoulder bars because yeah, that yeah. was ultimately Porteous' mistake that led to that. He didn't he didn't deal with the ball back. Properly. So um, sometimes the defenders, as Mr. Ross liked to say, 
fine margins are involved and sometimes the fine margins go for you and they go against you and I think well sports just overall performance was absolutely brilliant and for me it was man of match sorry to spoil any <laughs> any debate we're gonna have later on on that <laughs> uh, I do I do th- I do think you know ultimately that one moment was, was pretty pretty decisive yeah if, if Harry if it was if you if you were picking the team out of Rocky and Portress you're sort of seemed the two obvious to play on the right hand side who would you feel most comfortable with in the middle sorry because I always feel like the what the one in the middle is generally the leader of the back line and Portress has played the majority of the season obviously with Hanlon and McGinn that you say them yeah um, I, I don't really think it's set in stone I, I suppose it's the type of thing that you can be flexible with it depending on who you're against um, I think with the way that Hearts were relatively narrow in their way they weren't really using the wings too much when they were attacking I think that Portress being in the middle and being the focal point of the defence was a strength Um Aye, I, I thought that big Sims boy for them was an absolute huddy. Uh, so I didn't really think that Porches had much of a handful, but I thought he done well whenever he was challenged. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know how I'd... Aye, that's the thing with Porches, so for me, he's so inconsistent. See, if he played like that on a week-on-week basis, as Greg said, £5 million player, Scotland captain in a few years' time. But then you have the game, like, he always has that one mistake in his locker, like that back pass, which we'll have a debate in a bit, I'm sure. I think with a penalty, to be honest. But um, yeah, he just needs to try and cut that out of his game because ninety nine percent of the game, probably that one mistake could have cost it. Yeah. yeah um, can I just say? Can I just say on that? Just on the consistency point, it's important, right? But show me a twenty two year old centre half in the world game that's consistent, puts in a performance every week. I think you could probably know, say, show you a centre half in Scotland. That... I think there's a difference between a twenty two year old centre, your average twenty two year old centre half. The one that's been in the first team for nearly four years now. Like, I, th- I think experience has got to play in with it as well as age. Four years, but he had what for eighteen months of that probably out, at least with an injury. I, I, like, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think he is inconsistent, but I just don't. I don't. I, there aren't. There are not twenty-two year olds and a half who are turning in seven or eight, nine, probably nine and a half out of ten on Tuesday performances yeah. week in week out. It's just, it's just not a thing. Like, and and especially not when the the partner that they have gets switched every single game virtually as it's been over the last wee period of time. Aye. Well, speaking of switching up again, Maloney again, Greg, throughout the rest of the team, uh, made sweeping changes really. Joe Neal came straight back in. Uh, Josh Campbell dropped out. Your wing backs changed with Josh Doyle coming in for Mitchell and the front three was Muller. Nisbet and Deutsch. Um, was there any sort of standouts in the player that, players that came in for you? I know you've been quite critical of Joe Newell in recent weeks. Yeah, look, I've been, I've been critical of Joe Newell. I think it's it's probably been pretty spot on. But the other night, it was like the Joe Newell that we all know is there. Mm. He was incredible. He, he was putting in tackles. He was he was bullying that wee Cammy Devlin, who's an absolute myth. Um, the boy was just Excellent. Like you, you couldn't ask for any more from him. Um, I have been critical, and do you know what? It's probably been deserved because at times he has been too ready to go back the way. But on Tuesday, we've seen the Joe Newell that we all know is there. Yeah. And, you know, the ability that he's got is second to none. And that's what we want to see every week. Yeah. You know, I, I felt like maybe Jake Doyle Hayes was a bit quieter. I feel like he maybe slows the game down a bit more. Um, I, I like Josh Doig out on the left. I think when he doesn't have to focus so much on defending, you know, he, he, he's a player. Cadden solid as ever. Just the usual Chris Cadden performance for me. Um, so, yeah, I, I think the midfield was good. I think it was a good midfield. Yeah. Uh, and to be honest, I'd be looking for pretty much the exact same on, on Saturday. Cool. All right, Harry, um, we'll come on to some more individual performances later on, but let's actually get into the game itself. I personally felt like in the first five minutes or so, Hearts probably settled faster than us, but then sort of post that Devlin chance, I felt Hibs really took control of the first half. What did what did you make of the first half in general? I, think, I, I didn't really think there was much in the game at all, to be honest. I thought it was two teams that kind of levelled each other out with the playing styles, I think, clashed grotesquely. Um I've seen neutrals and stuff say they enjoyed the game. If I was if I wasn't a Hibs fan, I would have thought it was a terrible game of football. To be honest, I thought um, there wasn't really much created for either team. They, they had one setter and they had a volley in the box at one point that I thought was a really good chance. But apart from that, there was absolutely nothing in the first half. I thought was of note. Yeah, Liam, I guess 
Harry's touching on the Devlin chance there. The other two moments in the first half where obviously the Hibs disallowed goal and the penalty incident that you mentioned earlier. Um, where where you land on sort of the ref's decisions on on both of them? Do you think Poachers is just offside, just both, onside? Both both marginal calls, both marginal calls. Uh, the the offside is marginally offside. I'd love it not to have been, but. It was marginally offside by a ball here. I think uh, I've seen everything uh, in terms of the actions on Twitter to that uh, penalty. I've seen everything from never a penalty in a million years. It's a shoulder barge to Stonewaller. Uh, it's definitely not a Stonewaller. And it's, uh, I, I think for me, it is probably just marginally a penalty. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I can see why Don Robertson's not given it because the, the flight of the ball changes. You're always taught to look at the flight of the ball and you do see there's a, there's a deviation because... As Stevenson comes across, he does make some contact, but he takes a lot of the man before he does that. So it's probably just a penalty, um, but but certainly not a stone mauler. I thought, um, just touching it really, really briefly, I thought some of the Sky Sports um, punditry was quite pathetic on that, to be honest. Uh, that and the, the later incident that we're, we're sure will come on yep. to mention, um, both you know both being regarded as stone mall penalties, I thought was was quite pathetic, to be honest, and just. Maybe they need to look at the diversity of the pundits that they've got in these programmes because you had a Hearts man, you had a, an ex Hibs manager who's been sacked in the last couple of months. And, who was at uh, Hearts? <laughs> who was at Hearts and uh, someone else whose opinion, quite frankly, is just no worth listening to. So um, I just, uh, yeah, I, I, we, we've, 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 we've bleated on enough about Sky yeah. Sports coverage, Scottish football, but it was, it was poor, wasn't it? I mean, you know, I think what I, sums it up, the person out of there that could have every right to be the most biased was John Robertson on commentary, and he said it wasn't a penalty. You know, like so, how Chris Boyd? Let's just let's just call it what it is, right? He said he was a hundred percent certain if it was VAR, they'd had two penalties. Yet he stuttered before he even said he was a hundred percent confident. He's, he's just he's just he's, he's trying to make that click but you know he wants that title he wants that clip on sky sports and ultimately that's what he got um greg day two incidents in the first half liam mentioned seeing it on twitter i would probably see even in our group chat we've had polarizing opinions on the penalty i personally probably felt was just a pound of penalty you've been quite vocal and not thinking it's a penalty i don't think it's a penalty i think i think for, for me <clears throat> Although this doesn't constitute penalty or not, I think Sims is looking to go down. Now, that doesn't mean it's a penalty or not a penalty. But for me, I think Stevenson's come across him. I think so. maybe he's not won the full ball, but it's there to be won. You know, I don't think Sims is in total control of it. Stevenson's made up the ground. For me, it's not. The, the boy couldn't wait to go to the ground. Um, he, knew, he knew his chance was up. Um so I think he just went went to ground. Not a penalty. Um, quite good defending for Stevenson. Risky because if he's if he's a couple of seconds late, he, it's a penalty and he's off. But I, th- I think for, for me, he's probably read it fairly yeah. spot on and it's not a penalty. Do you think offside call was correct? I think so, yeah. I think I think the official's got it right, however frustrating it is at the time. You know, you do have to admit that he has got it right. You know, we always want correct decisions regardless. So, you know. Yeah. Credit where it's due. Yeah, a couple, right, a couple of other things to just talk about on the first half. Um, definitely, sort of more off the field stuff. The atmosphere. You guys spoke about it. Um, was it, was it on the one with the with the jambos uh, looking at the derby, or was it after the? I can't. Or was it the one after the love it? I can't remember what one it was. But obviously, Block Seven organised a good display. Uh, I think it went down well. Um, Retro Video Club Boy was on before the game. There was a bagpipe player by Maxi Pat Lining before the game. Um, what did you make of the atmosphere on uh, Tuesday night, especially in the first half when the team were sort of getting on top of the game? It was a nightmare to get a parking space on Tuesday night. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I didn't I didn't see the boy for Retro Video Club I think I got in five minutes before the game started but I like I like the, the heaters they'd be handy in the winter um, it was actually quite mild on Tuesday though um, but no to, to be honest I thought Block 7 done done really well with our display everyone joined in which is good to see um, and, and then you had the, the very poignant moment in the 13th minute yeah. where you know people People put aside the rivalry and, and the hatred and, and whatever and come together for a boy who whose life was cut far too short. Yeah. 
if you if either you boys what got anything you want to add or specifically around the sort of thirteenth minute? Um, I, I think I think from my perspective, um, in negative ways as well, and um, we've seen in the last week that there's some things that come um, before football, far before football, and um, that's obviously one of them. Um, for me, uh, there's this uh, thing between Hibs and Hearts fans that there's supposed to be an undying hatred for one another, but obviously there's a clear line, and I'm glad that we displayed that, you know, that, that wee boy, God bless him, um, far more important than whatever's happening on the football pitch. So we're well, probably all the um, staff and players as well that clapped along. Um, it was really an emotional moment, but I think in the best way possible. Yeah. Uh, I, would just, I would just add to that. I think it was it was really poignant. Um, probably one of the few times at Easter Road I've been, you've been in the middle of a game and you're all in the middle of the game, pausing, reflecting on something else that's, that's happened in the world. And, uh, it's obviously such a shame to, you know, to, to lose your life at that age. It's just incredibly sad. But, um, hopefully, uh, hopefully his family felt like um, the moment did them justice because I, I thought uh, it was, <laughs> don't really remember many times I've been at a football ground and felt like that. So, mm. yeah. yeah, I think it was a nice touch with the banner as well. You know, like, yeah, yeah, that, that sort of solidarity thing. Look, regardless of what football team you support, you know, mental health is is universal. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think it was a really important message, and I'm glad that, that everyone joined in. Um, but yeah, just uh, yeah. Look, I think know, says it's incredibly sad. But I think it's worth adding for us as well. I think we've maybe mentioned in the past, but any of our listeners, anyone that's aware of us or who we are, whether you if you need people to talk to, I would think I speak on behalf of all of us. We're always available, whether that be through the podcast page or our personal twitters. Um, we'd certainly try and help you out as much as we can, and just maybe the long bangers guys as well. They've obviously had their sort of heat bangers fin- uh, series, which. I'm not sure that might have wrapped up now, but it was um, no, that's a really good lesson as well for anyone that's sort of struggling or anything like that. But aye, right, second half, um, Harry, I felt Hearts probably took control of the second half where we had probably just about edged it in the first half. Um, were you disappointed with maybe the first half hour or so in the second half, or did you expect that to sort of come? I, I, I think, to be honest, like Hearts, in terms of the league form, have got all the momentum over Hibs on that occasion. Um, and, yeah, no, I, 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 as I say, I don't really think either team controlled either half. Um, I think they, they started getting more chances and creating more chances. Um, but that's when the big man, Dabrowski, started shining and showing why he deserved to start in goals. Um, I'll let the, the other lads touch on like key moments in particular. But, yeah, no, I was really impressed. I think that... One thing that was transparent was the communication between the defence and the goalkeeper, which has been missing all season. And I think even debatably missing under um, Marciano as well. It was just refreshing to actually see a goalkeeper constantly chat and players not look shocked every time the ball comes near them. Out with one incident. <laughs> but yeah, that, that wasn't on the keeper's <laughs> side, though. That was high. That, that was oh. Aye, look, Liam... Kevin DeBrowski came up trumps, didn't he? A couple of saves in the second half um, and won an advertent save from Rocky. Um, were you... They're saves you expect them to make, I would say. I don't I don't know if that's been harsh. They're good saves. I think the, the standout save of the lot for me is probably the reaction one from Sims down at his near post. Yes. Uh, and it comes back across. That's a very good save. Um, I think the others are sa- you're right they're probably saves you expect them to make you can maybe even argue that one you'd be disappointed if you didn't save it because it's, it's on his near side but it doesn't take away from it being a really good save um, he, he's for a big guy and I think he is a big guy looking at him he's probably not He's, I mean everyone goes on about Matt Macy's height but he's probably two inches shorter than Matt Macy or something like that and when you're jumping up there it doesn't really make a huge amount of difference um, but for a big guy he got down to that one well he also got down to the one which was probably his mistake pretty well too because I know it's the kind of the angle the ball's going at and where it's travelling he has to be smart I don't think he's ever going to get beaten by it but it's still it's still a good block um, so I was impressed with that one thing I would say on Dabrowski um, I think that in some respects he's maybe getting away a little bit with um, the kind of poor distribution uh, sort of shouts that have been thrown at Macy because I felt like a lot of the time on uh, Tuesday we just kind of went long. Um, yes. There was not a huge amount of I'm going to play it short to the right or left centre back. We were kind of going either up the middle and long or going longish to one of the wing backs. So 
you know, we, we've, we've not seen what he's like from a distribution point of view just yet, I think is the only thing I would say. Yeah. Um, but in terms of a short stopping um, record, he's got 100% record, so long may that continue. Yep. Just, just one thing, um, just with uh, it saves he should make, um, I always think it's difficult to judge because whenever you see a shot saved, you can't really imagine the keeper not saving it. So I think yep. the reaction to save in particular, like that's the type of one, if it does go in the back of the net, I think that's the type of one that you would be like, oh, you can't really blame the keeper for that. It was like hard shot and you're like close in. Um, but yeah, no, I just, I just wanted to make that point. I think it's difficult to judge if a keeper saves a shot, if it's an easy save or not sometimes, because I yeah, uh, because that Jeff, that Jeff Ashton tweeted us. Uh, I think maybe yesterday saying you can't say that yes. there are saves that Macy would make. You know, what's your opinion? You just like you can't realistically have an opinion on that because it's it's not it's not something that you can simulate. And if I have got one criticism of Macy that probably comes before his distribution, and I've been quite honest about that, is his positioning typically for me sometimes a lot to be desired which is why I think he gets beat at his near post um, as regularly as he has done this season so I can't really say with any honesty that Macy takes up as good a position as Dubrovsky because he might not have yeah. he might take up a better position so uh, it's just impossible to say Just just before we uh, move, like, I know we've got a ton of things to talk about before we talk about St Mirren but just while we've got uh, the subject of Dubrovsky all three is uh, who's in nets on Saturday if both are fit and available Greg no question. Harry? If the rescue doesn't start, I'm going to watch him. <laughs> Liam? Well, seeing as Craig Sampson's off the books now, there's only really one option, eh? Uh, I'll go for David Mitchell. <laughs> 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 um, right. Um, Greg, obviously Hibs did create a really good chance before them, but we also made five uh, before them, but we made five subs. Um I think it's something that we've probably all been fairly critical of Maloney as his substitutions. Like one was enforced with Josh Doyle going off at halftime, um, yep. but Dre Wright came on, Josh Campbell came on, um, someone please. No, we didn't make five subs. Sorry, we only nah, made four. we only made four because you and Henderson came on. Yeah, you and Henderson came on. Used the three intervals. Yeah, the three intervals. Yeah. Um, what 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 did you make of the substitutions? Um, on, uh, on no, Tuesday night. You know, let let's get it right. I will keep calling this out because Dre Wright and Josh Campbell are not good enough for a Hibernian football club. Yeah. Dre Wright made one pass in 15 minutes to Hibs Square. Uh, he's murder. Right. Let's get it right. He is murder. Um, Josh Campbell, I really don't know what he does to get in that team, to be honest. Uh, why not bring Why not bring a new boy on? Um, I said that and I said the boy that, for Fulham yeah. why not just inject you a bit of pace and, and go for it you know why not but for me yeah Dre Wright and uh, Josh Campbell seem to be indestructible under, under Maloney so far did, um, did, did, did we not say that everyone got a clean slate under Phil Maloney though yeah no, they did but, but they've had they've had the clean slate and they've not performed but what's, what's Dre Wright done wrong this time round like the last time I, under Jack Ross I get it but under under Sean Maloney he's not really done a huge amount wrong has he I think he's not really done a huge amount, under, though. Yeah, I That's think initially like he's, under... He's not, he's not really... He's not performed at a level I would expect him of, of a Hibs football player. I think for me, oh. Dundee United away, you know, yes, he was OK. But I just... Yeah, I, I just don't I just don't see it. But I don't think he's that good. I... You know, maybe Maloney sees something I don't. And, and if he does, perfect. And maybe Dre Wright will prove me wrong. But I don't see anything for Dre Wright at the moment at all to convince me that he's good enough to play for this club. The thing the thing with Dre Wright, and I, 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 t- I think I'd really bought into that as well, William, with the sort of clean slate thing. Dre Wright came in at Dundee United, and I, I'd, I'd go a little bit above what Greg said. I thought he was pretty pretty good at Dundee United. I actually thought he was decent at Celtic Park as well when he, what did he come off the bench at Celtic Park, first came back after the break. The bit that I don't understand with Dre Wright is I don't know what he gives you off the bench. That's... Like, you know, he started against Dundee United, I thought he was good, and I think he can... I just don't see him as a player that... I don't think he's lightning quick. He's n- out with his goal against Rangers. He's never really got involved sort of, in properly in the final third. Like, I, that's the only... And my criticism... Not criticism. My, I think my complaints on Tuesday were why didn't we bring on uh, Jasper? Like, I know he would only just sign him late and he'd only just come up, but he was on the bench, so... 
can 10, 15 minutes, could adrenaline get him through, you know? Um, and if it couldn't, have, could we have had someone else on the bench? I'm not sure. And I'm, I'm sure I'm going to say, son, um, I think Scott Allen would give us more in that position than Dre Wright does. Look at for, for 20 minutes, half an hour. It's not a free roll. Not a free roll. You need someone who's going to be relatively dynamic in that position who's going to pick up space. And I don't think Scott Allen gives you that. I think that's why Dre Wright's been preferred to Henderson as well, because I think he's more dynamic okay. in that position. I don't. I, 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 I take on board what both of are saying. I don't agree with it, but I take on board what he's are saying. I think you, you ultimately need someone who is going to be prepared to to put a shift in. I, I think, that the, the, unfortunately, I think what Jay Wright is, we probably should have let him go in January because every time he gets on the ball, there's collective gasps and groans and, and moans right across the stadium. And to be honest, it's a fucking terrible environment for a football player to have to play in yeah. every time he comes on the pitch. I do, I do agree, agree with that. that. I think the, la- the lack of support for him, the lack of support for him when he comes on the park is brilliant. Do, 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 you know, do you know what's pathetic about it as well? Is there's people who are moaning and groaning and having a gear him a hard time who've probably not even really seen the boy play. They're, they're literally doing it off the back of nothing because there's a lot of people at that game last night who don't go to Hibs games regularly. And I'm not going to dig at them, but if you're going to, if your only contribution to watching Hibs is coming to a couple of derbies a season and moan at a guy you've never seen play before, then you'd have a word with yourself. Well, we've seen it before where people judge the general atmosphere on Twitter and yeah. make up an opinion on that and then decide how they feel about, about a player like that. Yeah. Um, for, for me, for me, I, I feel like I've seen him enough to, to make a to make a judgment call. Like I say, hope he proves me wrong. I'd, I'd love that. Perfect. Yeah. Hopefully, but you know, if he's an asset, Tibbs, perfect. But at the moment, that that's that's how I feel about him, and it's very much the same with Josh Campbell. I, I just feel like he was very much a, a quick fix, and, and the quick fix yeah. has now gone on a bit too long. But right. Hey. Wait, I'm just sorry. Harry, I want to get your I want to get your opinion on the subs anyway. Um our good friend Connell tweeted saying he thinks Maloney's potentially been a victim of being able to make more than three subs, almost making subs potentially for the sake of it. Um but where do you land on his because you were quite critical of the subs at the weekend as well. Yeah, no, the the one thing I don't get, I just don't understand why he keeps on taking Muller off. Just keep the ball. And I don't understand, like, see the thing that really frustrates me. If you've got someone on the bench. Like, use them. If Jasper can he play, don't put him on the bench. Don't give us that hope. Like, that really wound me up when Muller was on the bench at Celtic Park because we were all like, we've got a new signing and we've been excited for him for months. We're desperate for a bit of pace, a bit of skill to come on the pitch and then leaving him on the bench. That game was crying out because see when Mitchell came on at halftime, Mitchell didn't have the best game of his career, but just the fact that he gave us a bit something different on that wing, it lifted the whole team. Like, what's they the came point on when, just- Harry? <laughs> What? <laughs> the half-time. When he came on at the halftime. Halftime. The halftime show with Harry McCarthy. Thank you, Greg. Um, yeah, but as I was saying, I, I was wondering why Liam was smiling and it was going to come. But yes, anyway, I think that um, we just need something a bit different um, that could have actually lifted the team um, apart from. But then we brought Andre Wright, uh, Campbell. I, I was I was discussing it with Liam. No, sorry, I was discussing with Liam's friend Brody before the game. Um, I just think that he was bled into the team entirely wrong. I think he should have been given that five game spell that he had over Christmas and then taken out the team just to try and let him settle into that a bit. I think that the overexposure to first team football has exposed the fact that he's not technically the best player. But I think that with young players, if you can give them bursts, then I think that inexperience kind of plays in their favour. And I think that he's kind of ruined. I'd, I'd, Every time he's on the team sheet and every time he comes on the pitch now, I get frustrated. Um, and Andre Wright, I think that he is massively a victim of social media. I think that if we had him 10 years ago, I don't think that fans would be on his back anywhere near as much as they are. Good example of that, Alan O'Brien played for a good 17 games before Hibs fans realised he was pish. If he was, if we had Twitter when we signed Alan O'Brien, he would have played three games before people were handing him out the door. Like, shows a really bad example there. Harry, no, hang on with Alan O'Brien. He didn't get the abuse that Dre Wright got until towards the end of the season. Like that right. abuse never came straight away. People would give right. him the benefit Harry, of the doubt on Twitter, wouldn't they? Harry, you've made your two ball point. Um, see, see if Dre Wright was playing 10 years ago, he'd probably be one of the best players in the team, though, because we were absolutely we were fucking shy. <laughs> uh, and See, on Alan O'Brien, the reason he got a pass for so many games is because we signed him for 250 grand to Newcastle and he had two, two caps for the Republic of Ireland when we signed him. So people just assumed he was going to be good. 
because we never spent money on players at that point. Like it was like Hibs have actually spent a fee on a player. And I, I remember probably about more than halfway through that season, him playing. I think Pat Lyon, did Pat Lyon not play him on the right or the left? Well, he was left footed, he played him on yeah. the right. Uh, and he, and, he, and I, I remember willing him to be good, like just willing him to do something. And he just, he, he just couldn't, eh? he had nothing in him. Anyway, sorry, massive. I, mind, uh, I think it was great though. He played the games <laughs> and mate, he actually, he was so quick, right? And he got through one on one, he just put it straight at the goalie, like passed it back to him. I said, Geez, this is going to be a mate. long season of this plunge playing left mate. mate he don't get a really good fast. assist against Celtic. I've won the Aye. same. Aye. He, said, he said, I'm calling, I would say it was really good, but he said, I'm well, he get, like, gets to the byline and he uh, done his that, job. <laughs> that game against Gretna was the game where. Uh, I'm sure he played Steve Pino and Fabian and Torno up front together. <laughs> we were uh, two 0 down at the half time. I'm sure that we came back to win four two. Right, look, easy. let's get this. Let's get this show back on the road. Look, after the subs and that, I felt like in the last 10, 15 minutes, I thought if a team was going to win, it was going to be us. The 90th minute chance falls to Josh Campbell and look I know he's telling me that I ramble on and stuff I'm getting my opinion in there there's no excuse about missing that I'm sorry I don't give a fuck he has to score I, I, I'm i sorry it's, 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 it's a dreadful miss he's hit right it's, he's got to score I'm sorry 90th minute and yeah circumstances are dictating my thoughts on it but score and to be honest Kevin Nisbet has to, to score on the re- or at least hit the target on the rebound like it's inexcusable. Hearts didn't miss that. I genuinely believe that. Like that's the best chance of the game. He's he's unopposed for eight yards, and he's put straight in the middle. Depends who's playing for Hearts. Stephen McLean's not finishing that. Like he'd fucking break his hip trying. Against us, he is. The shite, the, yeah. Against us, he is. I know. I think Harry nah, mentioned it on last week's pod. The fucking shite of the Hearts play. The more likely they are to fucking score against us. No, nah, but I just want to say, I think you're being very harsh on Kevin Nisbet. I think Kevin Nisbet was maybe, straight. yeah, maybe, yeah, but I think I, the I Campbell is you know, Campbell. All, all you have to do is put a bit of direction on that and put it in a corner. Um, the, the thing I say is, as long as you get it on target, I'll no complain. But in a 90th minute against Hearts and not got a chance to respond, pretty much you need to bury that. End of story. That's not good enough. Right, right. And- See, for me, <clears throat> um, it's a bad miss. You know, it really is. However, I think Civic's probably done pretty well to, to get him selling the way he's throwing him yeah. selling there. Right, yeah. so the set of half speaking. He's in the middle of the goal, though, mate. Like, he's right, in the middle Ewan, of the goal. Ewan, settle. <laughs> so the set the centre half has done well because he's launched himself that and made himself as big as possible. It is literally I know I know he probably should score it and you know what you're right, he probably should score it. However, the fucking centre half's literally thrown himself right at it. It's difficult because the way that the way that Civic's got in and the way that Josh Campbell's hit it, it's just that it's it the does pair, the pair have collide. So I th- I also think I think you're probably going to be harsh on this bit as well. Um, yeah, no, however, they're probably harsh however, on this bit still. However, he needs to start learning to fucking hit the ball first time. See this, take the touch. See, see when players take needless touches, and it really annoyed me that night because players were taking needless touches. It comes into him and he takes a touch and that just allows the centre half to come across. I can't remember. I, he, took it, he took it on his left foot He's really and he tried to take to a his touch right. on his right. Just hit it with the left and you know what? See if, see if the goalie saves it, at least you've made them make a save. Right? But just get it away first time. That, that's my pet peeve when folk try and cut back onto their bare foot. Just fucking hit it there. Go I'm up a, and use both feet. I'm going to, I'm not going to bat. I, I think it's inexcusable not to miss it, but he does do the right thing uh, in terms of he keeps it done and stuff. You know, I think it would have been easier. I think he missed a similar chance against Motherwell. He's, he's hit high, it's hit the bar. And I want to say a sort of half volley broke him at the edge of the box that he skied that game as well, or vice versa. Yeah. Like, yeah. And he's done the right thing, trying to keep it down, but he just he has to score. As a late, Liam, and you probably disagree. It's a very good contact. It's a very good contact on the ball. First things first. It's a volley. It's diff- It's not the easiest position. It's a very good contact. I, I do agree with he probably should have hit it either side or hit it into the ground. Just fucking hit it anywhere apart from where he hit it. But it's a very good contact from a player late in the game. Unfortunately, I think it's just one of those moments that's kind of almost like defining this time at Hibs, isn't it? Like, got into the right position. That and the, the hard work of getting there. 
and then just not putting the chance away. And for a guy who's playing a bit further forward in midfield, maybe even arguably taking up the position that McGuinness has, there's just going to be a certain reliance and expectation on you to score goals, particularly at a time when we're not scoring. And he scored, what, one and maybe about 15 appearances or something like that, the goal against St Mirren. Yep. Um, he's got, he, he does have to do better, I'm afraid. I was going to say, he, did, he has scored yeah. this season, hasn't he? Aye. Can I just go back to Harry's point about Muller? I think Muller was, was absolutely dead in his feet, to be quite honest. And I, and I think I think we, we've seen it where Muller still, has to, still needs to adapt to Scottish football. Um, he was driving forward in the first few minutes, sorry to take it back, and he should have played Cadden in and he didn't. Yes. He held on it for too long. So, yeah, I think I think Muller probably came off at the right time. Um, I, th- I would I, agree. I, 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 I'm not convinced that the person that came on for him was the right sub, but hey, we've covered all that over yeah. the last 10 minutes. Um, yeah, sorry, I just, I, I just wanted to, to, yeah, no. to pick that one out. I think there's sorry, snippets. Harry. Would we all agree, though, just with, I guess, we've seen Muller now over sort of the last three or four games for various length of times. There's there's something there. I think we've seen on mm-hmm. Tuesday, definitely still adjusting. I think at times he's quite easily bullied off the ball. He chucked a wee dive in, I'm sure I know. That might have been at the weekend, though. It was either the weekend or on Tuesday night. Um, but I was fairly impressed with what he offered on Tuesday night against Arts. Um, right. Liam, your man of the match was uh, Ryan Porteous. Harry, Greg? There was, there was, there was, there was I, I say probably one there was a lot of competition, but he was, I thought he was man of the match, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, mate. Me, Poitras? Uh, yeah, definitely Poitras by a mile. To be quite honest, the, the boy was incredible. Yeah. Most fouled player on the park, but he's a thug, so okay. <laughs> what about yourself, Harry? It depends what narrative you drive. <clears throat> Not man of the match, but I thought one player who actually had his best performance in a while, I thought Jake Donald Hayes was very good. I thought that he was getting about a lot more than we've seen him in recent weeks, so I was quite happy with his performance. But um, for me, it's a coin flip between... Would you call it um, Kevin Porteous? And I'd probably give it to Porteous as well. I thought Porteous was very good. Yeah, I would. I would. I, I was definitely thinking around Porteous as well. To be honest, I thought Porteous was really good. Uh, I've been quite critical on here, probably more so than any of you, you three. And I, no, I thought I thought he was really, really good at during the weekend. Do you know what is actually really fucked me off again? This narrative of what he done holding his head after the absolute non-existent fucking penalty claim. Any other fucking player in the league, or to see if Ryan Poitras is 30, 30 year old, they say, oh, he, that's him using his experience there to slow the game down. But because oh. he's putting a couple of bad tackles against Rangers, this fucking narrative's getting driven again that he's a cheat, that he's this, he's that. I think Chris Boyd was mouthing off about it when they were right, talking about it. Right, hold on. Like, no, no. <clears throat> Let's get it right. Chris Boyd, right, come on. If anyone listens to what he's got to say, may as well sit and fucking listen to Neil McCann and take what he says as gospel. Right, Chris Boyd, man, do me a favour. The boy's an absolute pellet. But you, the, Chris, the, Chris Boyd spent fucking half his life in his arse and arse, so I don't know what he's piping up for. Promoting mattresses in fucking Timberland, oh, yeah, Portland, oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, no, look, like, every person in the stadium knew Poachers were right there, but it's not his fault the ref stops it. it, it it's experienced play, isn't it? I mean, at, at that point, we, I feel like we were under the cost bit because they just had a free kick right. in our box. So why not just slow the game down? You know, of course it's frustrating if it's against you, but the game management. So I mean, settle the tempo, get back into it. I don't really see what he's done wrong, but look, I'm Ryan Port just could fucking spit on the ground, and Chris Boyd would want him to go to jail. Like honestly, the narrative that gets driven against a 22 year old lad. They were talking about mental health earlier. Chris Boyd can happily sit in his chair. And slag these people off. Who has a mental narratives. health charity, by the way? Uh, yeah, and drives narratives that this boy's a thug, he's a hooligan. But do you know what? There we go. Chris Boyd's a tit. I just, I just think it's so hypocritical of Chris Boyd. And do you know what? He does a, does a lot of good work for charity and his mental health charity. Absolutely. But he sits and slates boys when in, in the media and the news when I don't really feel it's, it's correct, necessary, or justified, in my opinion. Yeah. You two got either anything to add to the portrait, sort of? Just, just want to say that it's incredible that the biggest hatchet man in Scottish football didn't commit a single foul and then with Arby on Tuesday night, Is that 12 right? fouls against them. Not wow. a single foul. Uh, wow. 12 fouls against them. I think there's an element of the fouls that um, were committed against them. He is very uh, smart, but there's been 
hundreds of vendors I can name down the years. Right, He'd be that's... very clever at buying fills. Um, he is. He is quite often. Um, I think aggressed upon because he can play football. And it was a sport. Won't stop him playing football. I don't know if any of you have watched sports game, but I was listening to Sports Sound in the car coming home, and uh, Stephen oh. Thompson was fucking hammering him. Out, well, who did they have on? Who did they have on? Uh, sports Sound was it Alan <laughs> Preston, Jim Jeffries? Did they have George Folks? Was he on it? Uh, <laughs> Uh, Leslie, Dean, Leslie, De- Leslie Dean's make, make, make an appearance. Any other uh, yeah, special it, was... guest? Anne Budge. Oh, right, okay. I I, uh, I, uh, Craig Levine. Craig Levine, of course, him. he's on there. Craig yeah. Levine now. Um, Derek there, Ferguson. Derek Tom, Tom English was probably spouting shite as well. Tom, Tom English was spouting shite. Uh, Tom, Tom Ellis, English. Uh, the, two that, the two that were hammering portraits was Tom English and Stephen Thompson. Uh, oh. Well, let's get it right. Stephen Thompson, I mean, wow, okay. Um, <laughs> Tom Is that English a good pundit? They made him a presenter. <laughs> uh, um, Tom English point never kicked a football as puff. So yeah, it's fine. We'll not have to hear for Tom English for the next six weeks. Six Nations starts uh, this weekend, so he'll be away. Oh. He'll be away at the egg chasing. Right. Anyway, he'll be, we- he'll be wearing his flare jeans and his fucking big brown shoes. Uh, uh, yeah. John McGinn when they get in the Celtic team. Right. Uh, <laughs> let's wrap. Let's wrap this game up. Um, just in general, were you? Pretty satisfied with what you've seen for Hibs on Tuesday night. I, I, I'll be um, honest, that I was. I thought no, we could have been a, no. I, I, we could have been a bit better, but I was pretty happy. No, I'm never happy. I'm not happy to be honest because we didn't beat them. So why yeah, would you no, be happy? No, of course. No, of course. Look, look in comparison to in comparison to Saturday's shit show, it was better. However, uh, there's a long way to go. Yeah, you know, there's a long way to go. But it, it was better, but. Okay. Still wouldn't wouldn't class myself as happy. Liam, Harry, performance. Um, yeah, no. I, the the only thing is, obviously, you can only play what's in front of you. I thought that the fight was there, but um, if we play like that without the fight, which I don't know if we'll have, if we've not got a full packed out Easter Road with fire going on before the game. Um, it does concern me that we've not got goals in this team. Um, I think the defence kind of looked like it was taking shape, but we created one chance at the end and we didn't take it when it came. And that's a real worry for me going forward. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think the final third's a wee bit of an issue just in terms of number of chances that we're creating, particularly quality chances. I feel like uh, there's going to be a lot of expectation on this boy, Melkerson, when he's eventually ready and fit to play. I thought the expectation with Muller was huge, but uh, Melkerson's going to have even longer to wait if we're not scoring goals with regularity when he comes into the team. We do we are missing something in the final third. I'm not sure what it is. I'm not sure if it's just that kind of real quality final ball kind of player or if it's a finisher. Um, but there's 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 definitely something missing ingredient now. Right. Let's go on to St. Mirren game. We'll wrap up the transfer window after, right? St. Mirren preview. Uh, Liam, you were talking about Melkerson there. I seen a tweet today saying Melkerson confirmed on his uh, Instagram live last night that he's going to be in the squad at the weekend. Um, but I didn't speak Norwegian, so I, I've not got a clue if that's true or no. Um, what I do can is he was kicking fuck at a fucking mannequin, so he looks a bit fucking mad. But aye, St Mirren, what are we expecting? We've played them twice this season, drew both games, chucked leads in both games, um, one under Jack Ross, one under David Gray. They've lost players like Brophy and Co. to injury and McGrath to transfer. Greg, will Hibbs win? No, because St Mirren have got a world-class midfielder who scored the other night for them. <laughs> I, I'm assuming he'll not be able to play. Uh, I, I, I really don't care if he does or doesn't. Um, <laughs> but yeah, to be honest, St Mirren are a funny one. Um, they're never really that consistent. Play consistently and consistent, but uh, they're going after Lee Griffiths, so good luck to them. But um, yeah, I think if we can take what we the performance on Tuesday and add a wee bit more quality in the final third day. They won't be a match for us. You know, we have got we have got good players at the club. Um I think if we can just add that wee bit of quality, the wee bit of final touch in the final third, then I think I think we'll win the game. Um and I'm, I actually think we'll keep a clean sheet as well to be fair. Okay. So yeah. I, I, before you ask me for a score protection I'll tell you it's going to be Three oh, jeez. Right, okay. Uh, aye, Harry, we touched on it there. Um, Jamie McGrath was obviously linked with Hibs for only five seconds until the evening news put the daily record in their place on Monday night or Sunday night. I can't remember what day it was, but he's felt like he's a massive player for them. So are we? is this St Mirren team a little bit, are we a little bit in the dark with them now? 
and with Brophy being injured. You know, it's one of those teams that um, I think they've been on TV the least of any team this season, if I'm not mistaken. So I can't lie and say that I've seen too much of them. Um, I know that McGrath was one of their better players, and I know that Brophy obviously played very well um, in the home game when we faced off against them and he got his goal. Um, so, yeah, if they're starting with Curtis Main up top, then I think that we're probably in a good position. Um, but I, I don't really know what's going on at St. Martin in terms of their striking situation. If they're looking for Lee Griffiths, then it must be desperate. Um, Liam, you've maybe quietly tips that Martin have been in decent form, maybe to make a push for the top six. So are you expecting a difficult game or has the last few days with the things we've mentioned there, um, like, do you think that's maybe going to derail them a little bit? Um, possibly. I don't necessarily think the strength of St Mirren's or centre forwards, to be honest, I think since they've been in the top flight, they've not really had anyone who scores goals consistently. I think Obika was like their top scorer with like six or seven the year he put Hearts down. Um, had to get that in there. Um, <laughs> I, and I don't think they've really had anyone who's been prolific. I think they've got, they got Brophy last January, didn't they? Thinking that he would score yes. lots of goals. And I think all he's done is take lots of shots, but not score many goals. Obviously, with him being injured, they find it difficult. I think they've got a bit of a reliance on kind of Greg Kilty to get forward. I look at the other strikers they've got on the books, guys like Lee Irwin and them. To be honest, they really don't concern me. They really don't worry me. I think I think the strength of the St Mirren team is they're, they're battlers. They're, they're workhorses, generally. They've got a lot of guys in the team who will run all day for them. Might give our midfield some problems just in terms of energy. I've been really impressed with the boy, uh, Curtis Ronan. I think I said that the last time he played them. I think he looks like a really, really is he decent the one that scored the screamer against Rangers? He is, I. Um, and Aberdeen, uh, and Aberdeen last week. Lovely, right. balanced footballer. Quite, <laughs> quite wee and diminutive. I, I don't think he'll get a game at Wolves when he goes back. I don't think he's quite built for the Premier League. Um, but he's certainly technically quite good and, and seems to have a good engine. Um, and they just they just sign like really solid SPFL level pros. Eh? Like Joe Shaughnessy has been yeah. brilliant for them. He scored against us a couple of times, <laughs> most notably quite recently. Um, <laughs> but they're not. Yeah, I, he scored I, both I games this season. Six. Yeah, yeah. I both so I'm just crosses. I'm just looking I'm just looking at their team from uh, their game against Motherwell during the week. So I'd, like Liam said, the back line's just fully sort of experienced players. Fraser, Sean has said, Dunn, Richard Tate, midfield was that, Power uh, and Ronan. Yeah, right, that, that Alan Power, like, it's just... And then the, the, this free, the three player. that they had behind Brophy, um, young boy Henderson that scored the World Day up at Dundee yeah, United. It was like 17 or something. Yeah. Kilt AM behind the striker. And Jordan Jones, they signed on deadline day uh, on the left-hand side. <clears> He's historically given us quite a hard time when he was at Kelly and probably when he was at Rangers as well, but especially at Kelly. Um, then we'll have to watch out for that. I'll be honest, I don't even know where he went down south. Uh, Sunderland. Um, oh. Sunderland. In League One, so he can, he can hack it in League One. Still can hack it in League One because he's up on loan. So. I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not overly concerned. Chris Cardinal pocket, I'm no problem. And it's worth mentioning that only, so they only had how many subs are you allowed to men, name the now nine? Yeah, they only named six subs during the week, and the only striker they had on the bench was Lee Irwin. So, unless they sign someone between now and Saturday, I'm guessing it's Lee Irwin up top for them. That's enough about our opponents. Um, Liam Hibbs 11, we've all agreed we want to see Kevin Dabrowski and goals back three stay the same. What were you expecting? We've seen plenty changes under Sean Maloney game on game. Same team for me. Same team for me. Uh, I wouldn't make any changes uh, as long as Josh Lloyd's good to go. I'd play him as well. I'd keep Mitchell there as a bench option and probably Henderson as a bench option too. But same team. Harry? Yep, I don't, don't really see any reason to change it. Again, I'm a bit worried at the fact that we're not creating chances, but I think if we can at least be solid defensively um, for a bit, then at least that gives us something. Greg, any changes? <laughs> no changes. <clears throat> um, what I would like to see is a back three of Portress on the right, Rocky in the middle and Stevenson on the left, purely because Portress and Stevenson can carry the ball a wee bit. Um, so I move into that midfield area and, and spread the play. Um, we've, we've seen that Rocky can't pass a line for himself, so yeah, stick to headering and kicking it real hard and real long. Yeah, I think... I think... 
I would be inclined to pick the same 11 as well, but for the element of us, no, I'll just say the same shite. And speaking about St. Mirren more than we have about Hibs for this game, I find there is an argument to say that you want Ewan Henderson to play. Like, I don't know if he was great against Livingston, but I thought he did make a bit of difference during the week. That being said, it would have to be at the expense of Dodge for me, um, who again probably didn't have his best game on, on Tuesday night. Um, well, let's call it what it is. He was absolutely shite and he was dreadful and he's slow and he doesn't do anything. He doesn't contribute. He doesn't add anything. But you want him to start? Game again, maybe, a game, maybe a game against St Mirren might, might be the, the catalyst for him to kick on, but yep. he looks slow. Slow AF right now. But I think, look, do you know what? He's come back from I think maybe it's probably quite a difficult game to, to go and start in. I think maybe a game against St Mirren might be a better option for him, but if he doesn't do it there, then I don't, really don't know what's next for him. But yeah, yeah he, he was bad. He was really bad. I was really disappointed by him, actually. I will hope for that we might see Melkerson this weekend, uh, at least on the bench in the squad. And obviously we've got um, our new signing, who we will maybe come to come on to talk about as well, um, J- uh, Jasper, as he, do you reckon he'll only be able to find his way into the bench, or do you think there's a chance that he might uh, come straight in and start another? I think oh, Kerala will be on the bench. Pay them. Five subs. Pay them. Pay them. Change the game. Okay. Right. Well, Greg Ski does his, his score prediction. Do you want to remind us of it? Because I forgot it. Uh, 3 0. 3 0. Uh, Harry. Do you want the honest one or do you want the Harry one? <laughs> uh, the honest one. The honest one. <laughs> uh, I reckon it'll be 0 0. Liam, 3 o'clock. Saturday, are we going to be more entertained than the were against Lovey? I just don't want to be going in uh, late in the game against St Mirren with a one goal lead. So I'm going to say 2 0 Hibs. I am going to say it will be 1 0, but I think we'll play well. I think we'll play well. And it'll be like a 60th minute goal, 70th minute goal, and it'll be fairly comfortable, is my hope, because I'm hoping St Mirren offer absolutely nothing in the final third because they've only got Lee Irwin. So put your money on Lee Irwin to score. Um, sorry, sorry, just before we move on, what would that actually constitute as play well at the moment? Because like, Great chance. You know, the one, the, the one thing for me that I really want us to see this weekend is create chances from open play. I would, Do you know what would really turn me on? if we played a pass through the middle of a centre-back and Kevin Nisbet ran through one-on-one and goal. Like, you know, like, just... I, like, I, would en- I would enjoy a nice wee passing move where folk are taking 10 touches at a time. I just feel that now where the chant... I, I was surprised. I thought we dominated Hearts at set pieces uh, on Tuesday. And I would just like us to... Obviously, the goals against Livy were the Cad and Cross was about a freak goal and Mitchell's was... Cor- corner, I think, or second. Like, I would just like us to create chances from open play. You know, how, like, you know when you're you're watching a game and you feel like you're actually going to score. Like Aberdeen, I didn't they really feel like we were going to score. We scored for a corner. Like, I'd just like to go to Easter Road and feel like when we're watching that there's a good chance we're going to actually score goals. I wonder when the last time was that Hibs went in an Edinburgh derby with probably a taller team than Hearts. Mm. I think that's ever happened in the history Can of it? football. Because yeah, remember when Craig Levine just went through that period of signing cunts that were like six foot five and then signing she, other guys that were six foot five because their mate said he was sound. Like, is what, is, she, do you want to the transfer window if you just start slagging fuck it, Hutch? Because I'll she, be honest, be I didn't think they were that great. Well, I mean, Cammy Devlin's a myth. They absolutely love him. I mean, he was more like a linesman for about 10 minutes. That's all he really <laughs> done. Um, but then give me, he was non existent. At Cochrane's toilet, Halliday got set about, um, and then tried to go off off the pitch at the far side, and Don Robertson knew that was not going to end well, so dragged them back over. Sims is like a car horse. I've seen jumbo jets turn quicker, uh, and Craig Gordon's a fucking goon for Belenno. So, <laughs> do, do you know do you know who I genuinely and really want to give him too much credit and go back to the game? I thought Civic had a very good game for a guy who was basically just parachuted into the eleven. Obviously, had that one moment that stands out. I thought, other than that, I thought it was really good too. Two I wouldn't half, go as far as really good, to be honest. I, I really wouldn't go as far as that. I think he was okay. He, he, he was blocking I'd say, him. I'd say him and Porteous were the best players in the park. But 
we know how high your standard is for centre halves, Greg. They've basically got to be able to keep ten out of ten for you to say that we got pass marks. So uh, correct. I mean, I, I mean, uh, Maldini can't have had on this. That sort of that's sort of when uh, when when Sozzi got that ten for the keep for his performance in last year, and uh, was it I gave exactly him a seven. European final. Greg gave him a six point five and said he needed to work on his passing range. It was okay, but I didn't say he was a ten. <laughs> See better to be fair. Uh, nah, he's a fucking player. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 we, we didn't need to go over the derby anymore. I think we spoke about enough. Transfer window, uh, deadline day, because you guys recorded before that. Am I right in saying when you were recording, we were being linked with Jamie McGrath? So, obviously, that one uh, died died yeah. on its face probably before, before you'd, we finished recording. I was going to say before you'd even <laughs> finish recording. Um, there wasn't that much chat about incoming really throughout the day, um, which. It was probably a little bit disappointing. Uh, I think we all felt there was two or three positions that we wanted to strengthen on deadline day. We bought cool. in um, Jasper from Fulham on loan until the end of the season. And we have a sort of option to buy a similar deal that we've got with Rocky. Um, Greg, the three players that left, two on loan, but we're probably never going to see again with our contract situations. And obviously Stephen Bradley, who we will be seeing again um, with the option to recall him from his loan in the summer. What do you make of the deadline day business specifically? And then we'll come on to the window as a whole. Remind me again who left on loan? Gogic and Murphy. There we go. 11 <laughs> out of 10. <laughs> to be honest, like, uh, uh, the pair had to go. Like They had to go. Um, we only got one in, look. I don't, I don't know if I'm trying to play any more. I think... We pointed in our centre half, but we've got Harry Clark coming back, so it's difficult. You don't want to just bring in someone for the sake of it. Um, yeah, really, probably quite glad to see the back of Murphy, to be honest, because I know that he got a game last week against Livy, and to be honest, I really don't know what he'd done other than get booked. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm not overly bothered. I think it, at times it felt like the window was probably quite poor. Time will tell. In a month's time, we'll have a, a better understanding of where it was. In my opinion, I would like to see another couple come in though. Yeah, Liam. Um, again, just same question to you. Just the deadline day activity specifically. How did it leave you feeling? Uh, probably just a bit underwhelmed, to be honest. Um, I, I mean, I'd be you know, similar to Greg. I think everyone knows I'm not Jamie Murphy's biggest fan. I was quite happy to see him go, particularly considering he's one of the higher earners at the club. Gogic kind of less so because I'm probably different to Greg and I thought Gogic did a job for us last season I thought he was decent um, I think this season well maybe not this season actually maybe really just since Maloney's come in I think it's quite apparent that he's not really his plans he's not his kind of player um, so it's understandable that he moves on loan but he goes with my best wishes because he's a guy that's always given 110% yeah. he's been really decent at times um, I think the, the signing the Jasper signing I'm like yeah Maybe, 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 it'll, maybe it'll be great. Who knows? You know, eighteen games alone at Colchester in League Two screams signing from a different era to me. But yeah, I like every player that comes in, I'll give him a chance and hope he, hope he can, hope he can do the business for me. But uh, or for us, sorry, I should say. But, um, I think my, my over, over, overarching disappointment is we took in three million pounds for Martin Boyle, and as yeah. of yet, we don't appear to have reinvested any of that money in the squad. So. Yeah, I think that's like, a frustrating thing. Like. You, you lose your best player, and it seems like Kim didn't have any idea yeah. of who they wanted to bring in. For me, that that's very, very poor management. And this is see, and, so I, and I don't put that, I don't the... put the blame at Maloney. I don't think it's Maloney's fault. I think whose fault it is is the people higher up. Who, yeah, of course. I who, think... who should have who should have been planning for Boyle to go? Well, this is when, it. The first, when the first bid came in. You knew there was going to be another one, and it was probably going to be lucrative enough for us to accept it. And we've sat and we've done nothing. We've got three million quid there. It needs to be reinvested, but the squad isn't where any of us wanted to be. It needs to improve. I just think it's it's incredibly poor, lazy, quite quite unambitious to to leave it sitting there until until the summer. But, yeah, I think. See, when we first sold Boyle, I think I think I even spoke about it on here. I didn't expect us to go out and spend money on anyone. You know, I didn't, I didn't, or maybe I didn't expect us to go and do anything extravagant. But then Maloney spoke about how they'd been planning for it pretty much since the first bid. And I thought, oh, well, yeah. they've got something, they've got something in the pipeline here. 
and obviously nothing came of it. And that, I think, what sort of... Sure, I'm going to go back to the summer as well. Jack Ross in the middle of the summer said, was it after the Arsenal friendly that he wanted a centre-half and he wanted a striker? And he ended up getting James Scott and Nathan Wood on loan pretty much on deadline day. Like, that's twice now under different regimes where the messages that have been given out to fans seem, I would say, to not necessarily add up with what's came in the door. Um, and look, Harry, I know I've not come to you for deadline day, but I'm, I'm cautious that we just the night we're just reiterating each other's opinions. So let's look at the transfer window as a whole. So we've brought in uh, Melkerson. Muller's obviously available now. Um, Dimitri Mitchell, uh, who else have we brought in? Rocky, Harry Clark, uh, Ewan Henderson, Sylvester Jasper. And is that it? Aye, Dylan Tate came back and disappeared again. Um, going out, obviously Dan McKay's went on loan, Dylan Tate's went on loan, Jamie Murphy... Uh, amongst others. How do you view the transfer window as a whole? Because I think we were all pretty positive after the first week or so. I know, because I, I think... Sorry, what are you saying, Greg? Sorry, sorry, I'll carry on. No, I was, I was just going to say, I think um, it started off really positively, um, but I think the reason it started positively is because we had a bid for Martin Boyle that we rejected straight away, and we said that we had an, an evaluation for him, and then we refused to accept until they met it, which I thought was entirely fair. But from that point how many days left did we have to replace them at least come up with a suitable bid for someone try and get the fans at least behind it we've replaced them with some boy that as Liam identified was on loan at Colchester um, they're screaming his praises but in 10 really days it was, was sold on the 21st of January because see the thing is for me for a football club with a statue of Hibs um, we should have the player to replace him identified on the 1st of January and it should be 10 days of constant negotiation to try and get that player in as soon as Martin Boyle leaves, and that clearly wasn't the case. Um, obviously, I don't know what's went on in the background, but he left and it did leave. Like He didn't just leave as our best player, he left as a fan favourite. Like Everything that everybody loved about Hibs was Martin Boyle and a human, and the fact we've kind of had that stripped from us without any form of replacement is kind of hard to stomach. I know it's only January and it's difficult to bring in these types of players in January, but... Um, the one positive, though, I'll say the Jasper signing, the fact that um, it's an option to buy, if I'm not mistaken. I hate yes. just point loan signings for down south because they just transpire into nothing. But the fact that if we do like him and he likes us, they can take him on next season. Another thing I think that goes underrated, I don't really know too much about any of the players, but we've been stacking up the development team. Um, yes. I think that being realistic, it's something that we've massively suffered with in the last few years. Um, we've had maybe two or three players break through that have been quite positive, but back in the day, we used to have like a couple of golden generations, um, and we've not had anything near that uh, in quite a while, so it'd be nice to see us try and bleed through these players in the next two or three seasons. Yeah, Liam, a couple of names in there that I would uh, probably bow to your pronunciation uh, that have been signed to the B team on sort of longer term deals, they're all of ages that if we signed them and didn't say they were for the development team, you'd think they were for the first team, if you know what I mean. What, what do you make of this sort of strengthening that we're trying to do of that age category? Well, it'd be good because instead of saying that um, Josh O'Connor and Ethan Laidlaw should be playing the first team every week, people can say Emmanuel Johnson and Bruno Hauger should be playing every week um, when they start scoring goals for the under 20s. Like, no, I'm, 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 I'm only jesting. Um, I, I do think Look, I think it's a positive step in terms of helping to bridge that gap between under the eight teams and the first team. I think something's been needed done about that for, for a while. Hopefully what that team will be is a bit of a hybrid between under eight teams from this season. So they move on a level in their development and the guys that they've brought in, uh, I don't think it should be two things that are kind of mutually exclusive. But I do think, when we've talked about this at, at length in one of the group chats, we're in you and... Um, uh, if, if the, the schedule for the under-23s next season is to go down south and play English under-23 teams or development teams, mm. I'm not convinced that's necessarily going to bring on and develop players. I think they need to be playing competitive, proper football, yeah. ideally against uh, ideally against men, um, but if not against men, against young guys earlier on in their development. Um, I worry that we are going down the model of copying the Brentford route and thinking that's going to bring us success. I think if you look at where Brentford's success has been, it's not been from loads of guys graduating from the B team to the first team. Brentford's success has been on really strong recruitment. They recruit very, very well as a football club. I, I don't, and I'm not saying we don't, but I'm no. not saying, our, I don't think our recruitment department's as good as Brentford's um, based on the, the players that they've got playing for them in the Premier League who've cost 
pennies most of them. Um, so it's, it's difficult. On, on, the, on the specific signings themselves, um, it's, I mean, there's very little data, very little intel I've got out there on them to, to really be able to talk about, but data. hopefully... Is that an Irish accent there, mate? Don't fucking know, mate. <laughs> it was like some of the Irish in there. I thought it was like a wee bit. I thought it was Irish, and I was like, "Are you doing are you Jim Wink here? Transfer window <laughs> special talking about the Hibs development team. We've got Emmanuel Johnson, who's signed from Fairfield County in the hometown of Harry in the US of A. We've got Runer Hauger, who's basically Melkerson's mate, who's just going to room with them for the next few months and keep them happy while they're doing Instagram lives together in the bedroom. And we've got Alan Del Ferrier, who's joined from Standard Liège. Absolute player. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. That was fucking excellent. Oh, fucking hell. Liam, man, you're wasted on this podcast, by the way. Right, move move uh, on. Right. All right, look, back onto the development team. This was the <laughs> quote. For, it was Steve Keen was a... Uh, it was a quote from him. What's the boy for America, Johnson? Um, this is what I said. The development team will be a group of lads who are aspiring to be in the first team but aren't quite there yet. The team will compete in a lot of matches in England against teams through the under-23 system to help try and bridge the gap between under-18 football and first-team football, which I have said from day one is a huge jump. Now, yes, under eighteen's Scottish football to Scottish Premiership is a massive jump. Where do you feel, Liam, you've obviously made your opinion there, um, that un- English under-23 ranks in that? Because like, we've signed two guys specifically, obviously. Sorry, the guy from Belgium's name escapes me. Um, he, he was playing sort of second tier in Holland. And obviously, uh, is it Haig? Uh, he he played yeah. Hauger. He'd played sort of second division in, in Norway. So these guys have been playing competitive football to then take them out of that I, I can't claim to be an expert of any of these countries but I can't imagine their second divisions are all that bad you know to then pop them and go and play like you say Brentford's under 23s I think we played them a couple of years ago with Fraser Murray and that we're kicking about for me it doesn't really make sense you know it felt like something was going to come on the back of it whether that was like a, a, a application to get into a lowland league or something like that um, Greg where'd you land on that? Um, see, see for me I, I, I think Playing English under 23 cents is an absolute wasted exercise. Um, English clubs usually have large squads. Um, I think you should play against teams in Scotland, in my opinion. I think, however, it does provide good continuity the fact that we are investing in the development squad. Um, so yeah, I, I, I don't I don't agree with playing English under 23 sides, but I do think that there's definitely I'm all for bringing boys in. Um, I don't particularly like Steve Keir. I think that he's done anything significant in the game. Um, he's famous for the Blackburn protests when they released live chickens on the pitch. So I mean, to be honest, it's pretty pretty sad times. But like, Hibs seem to like him. He's seem to got going in his role. He's probably done a lot more than anyone else has done for the development team in what two months than anyone else has done in years and years so yeah I'm all for it I, I think that it's probably a good idea um, and it will be good and fans do want to see youngsters in the first team coming to the academy so yeah, hopefully it does help to bridge the gap and we, and we see players like Josh O'Connor and Laidlaw that Liam is, is a huge fan of getting in the first team Right uh, Harry you got anything to add on the development squad He's froze. Uh, transfer- he's not froze. He's, he's just sitting there silent. <laughs> you want to wake up? Nah, he's froze. Right. Uh, froze Liam, tran- we were talking about the transfer window there. Get a, get a rating out of 10. What, just overall? Or yeah, uh, overall. The team? Uh, ah, fuck it. Oh, yeah. Hib squad in general and the goings ons that have taken place in <sighs> the to, January window. Say, losing your best player and not making efforts to kind of replace him, whether that be replacing him as an individual or replace with multiple players. Uh, I think you have to take marks off us. So I'm going to go for five out of ten. Five out of ten. Do you feel like we're stronger or weaker now than we were on December 31st? Or 30, is, is there 31 days in December? Aye. Um, we're probably... 
we're not weaker, but we're not better. Right. <clears throat> the first week of the transfer window was about a 10 out of 10, but sadly, we're now in a 3.75 out of 10. Even I with outgoings? I, I, I would say, but even with outgoings, to be fair, I just feel like... I feel like we probably are weaker than when we started, but that's because we've lost Martin Boyle yeah. um, and not replaced them. So in, in terms of that, I would say we're weaker. I think that the players that we brought in, do you know what, they may come good, but at this moment, we don't know. we've not we've not seen them in their full potential. So for me, I would say we're weaker. However, we've got better squad depth, so it's a, it's a bit of a... Well, we've yeah, got depth the, there. But I don't I know guess... if it's better, but we've got depth. So it's a bit of a... Uh, it's clouded in it as well right now. Yeah. We've, we've seen Mitchell for effectively ninety minutes. We've seen we've not seen Harry Clark. We've not seen Melkerson. Rocky, I, I'm giving Rocky a pass for the Livy game because Maloney said half an hour before he had to come on that he really wasn't fit to play. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'd like to think that maybe in a month's time we're a bit happier about the squad when we've seen a lot more of the new signings fully settle in. Yeah. Jasper as well. And um, for me, I would. I'm right in the middle on it. I think, Liam, you would remember the same. I'm sort of a five out of ten because, do you know what? I think the players we've signed are interesting signings. I think they're pretty decent signings. But yeah, losing Martin Boyle, and this is the thing, any player that loses a player like Martin Boyle, even, you know, like it's, it's, it's a massive hit to take. And like you said, Greg, we haven't replaced it. I think, I don't think, we, I think we could have signed anyone. Uh, within reason and we'd probably still be struggling thinking we've not replaced them. Harry, transfer window out of ten, mate. Um, can you see me? Yeah. <laughs> um, we can hear you. Trans- 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 uh, I'll give you're a really uh, tinny though, and you're echoing. Just crack me. Well, okay, um, I'll give it a six. Right. Right, well, that's really just ended us on a depressing note a wee bit <laughs> after what I felt had been a fairly positive, um, positive episode, but we'll be back. Monday next week, reviewing the uh, St Mirren game. Fuck, we just spoke about a St Mirren game and previewing our trip to Ibrox on next Wednesday. Which, for anyone that hasn't noticed, Nick Walsh has been uh, named referee for the second time Ooh. that we've went to Ibrox this season. So just enjoy that one with your morning coffee when you're listening to us or watching. How, how, how far down the selection list, Jane Kevin Clancy was for that game? Oh, Jane, mate. Jane. Do you think Kevin Clancy maybe getting a uh, gig as like line or? I reckon he'll or be. Something? I reckon he's fourth official. I'm going to guess Aye. he's fourth official somewhere. I don't think he'll get a game. I, I reckon he'll be lucky to get a juniors game that, that day. <laughs> he, he, he's well. He was well in the pecking order now because you know I strongly wanted letter. I'm. I'm. Can, can we? 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 Can the Can we? 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 Can is, it, is that is that an actual legitimate thing? Did he come out and blame the ball boys? He didn't blame uh, the ball yeah, boys, yeah. but he was mouthing he, off at the. Uh... He mouthed off to John Beaton about the ball boys, and John Beaton had to go and speak to like some boy at Celtic to get the ball boys to behave or something. Like that. Honestly, <laughs> that's can they hands it? down the most pathetic thing I've ever heard after a derby in my life. Yeah, he the ball boys. Absolute loser. Imagine being what. final doom to your biggest rivals, and all you can moan about is the is the fact the ball boys are they getting you the ball quick enough. Do you know? Do you know? Do you know something? Do you know how um, we are? Obviously, because we we live in Hibs Twitter land, right? We think Hibs fans are reactionary and and knee jerk. Tell you what, some of the Rangers' reactions to that result last night—they're already talking about them being on a shugly peg after uh, what well, one one defeat really in the league, and they're like, "Oh, he's not the man for the job. He's not after this, that, and the other." And <sighs> tell you what, football is a funny old game, eh? Isn't that half, deep, mate. It isn't a half. Well, I've just had a look here just for continuity purposes. Next midweek, Kevin Clancy doesn't have a game as in any form. Linesman. For There's a surprise. Anything. There we this, go. This weekend, he has got Livingston Aberdeen, but he doesn't have a game the following midweek. We'll be finding them games that are safe. We'll be refing, refing Partick Thistle games for the rest of the season so that he, <laughs> he doesn't have to worry about getting lynched. <laughs> no, right. Aye, there's a wee rant about that. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, boys, thank you for having me back on after my hiatus. Um, it's been rather enjoyable. And we'll be back on Monday.
We'll talk Cheers. about it we have you back on Monday. Cheerio. <laughs> uh, we're going to have a wee review of your behaviour. <laughs> See ya. Good night. God bless. Fuck Nick Walsh. <laughs>